All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM, joining you from sunny blue sky in San Diego. And today I'm joined by Derek Van Ness, who is in Salt Lake City, Utah. How are you doing, Derek? Fantastic, John. Happy to be here. Yeah, and Derek's company, as you can see behind him, is Big Life Financial. And Derek's passionate about helping people reach their full potential. And he like, he's looking on removing the mystery and misinformation around surrounding money and financial strategy. And let's face it, I mean, there is a lot of mystery around it. There's a lot of fear around it. And there's a lot of misinformation. It's almost like the more information we get, the less information we get sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. So... Um, Financial and tax strategies um, to help small businesses. So what are some of the things that small businesses should, should be considering um, it, to get themselves, you know, as financially secure as they can and, you know, have tax strategies that works and work in their favor? Well, that's a huge question. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the big thing, John, from the tax side, a lot of people don't know if their uh, tax strategist or their CPA is doing a great job right? Yeah. Like your, your friend recommended them or you met them somehow. Could have been old school out of the yellow pages or online or something, but a little bit like going to the dentist, you know, or, go, or going to an auto mechanic. Like if you go into the auto mechanic and, you're, and your car's making a noise and yeah. then you come out and it's not making a noise, you assumed you did a good job, Yeah. right? But we don't know. Did they do like the MacGyver duct tape and chewing gum or did they do like a world-class electrical engineering, mechanical engineering type of job. And the same thing with CPAs. Um, there's a bunch of great ones out there and there's a bunch that aren't great. So one of our recommendations is you should have your taxes reviewed by a new set of eyes, a separate tax person once every three years, because you can amend mm. back every three years. And quite frankly, the, the tax code is about as long as the Harry Potter series, if you've mm -hmm. ever read, seen all those books back to back. So mm -hmm. nobody knows everything about it. Like yeah. slightly, I'm, slightly less entertaining, I think. Uh, a lot less entertaining. I have, <laughs> I have not read the whole tax code. I have read Harry Potter, but yeah, I wouldn't make it. So that's a really good point because I guess, as you said, I mean, we, we tend to, because when we're, when we don't know about things, like you said, like the analogy of the car engine, if we're not car people, we just assume that when somebody talks technical, that they know what they're talking about. And so, yeah. yes, we assume that our, that our, our, our CPA are tax. And as you said, I mean, sometimes it, it, it's often that maybe it was your personal CPA or somebody from before, and then it defaults into becoming your business CPA, but maybe that's not their skill set. True, true. I see that happen a lot. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it could be that someone was really great at one point, but as technologies evolved and with the Trump rewrite and all these other things, mm -hmm. like they just, maybe they're on the tail end of their career. Maybe they, uh, they brought in, a new CPA into their firm and you kind of got handed off to the new guy and the new guy's still coming up to speed. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And just to give you an idea, like when we audited a bunch of, uh, of the type of clients that we work with out of, out of those people per hundred thousand dollars of taxable income, they were on average overpaying about $11,000 a year. Wow. So a guy who's making a couple hundred grand, he's leaving 20 ish grand on the table every single year. So it, it's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's significant money for a small business or a sole proprietor or whatever. I mean, that's significant money being being left there. So how do you, uh, how would you recommend people that go about uh, a, a choosing? I mean, that, that was a great strategy you just said is getting a second set of eyes every three years. I think that's a fantastic strategy. What are some other strategies to make sure that you are getting the right advice? Well, you know, the truth is, I don't think it's worth a business owner's uh, time to necessarily become an expert at taxes, mm -hmm. but a couple of key things, like if you have to go to your tax person and say, Hey, we should do this, or I heard about this strategy. What do you think? And they go, Oh yeah, that's a great idea. We should do that. You're probably not with the most proactive planner, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so that's one thing. Another thing that I, I see that really separates the, the okay from the really good is just what I said, being proactive. They all tell you, oh, we wanna meet with you throughout the year and, and do things proactively. But if they're not really doing that, if you're not re really re meeting with them proactively, once December 31st comes, 
there's a lot of stuff you just can't do. You can't go back mm -hmm. and say, oh, wait, I spent this money in X because I didn't, or we classified it a certain way. Um, if you didn't do it, you didn't do it. So if you don't have someone who's proactively meeting with you at least once or twice during the year, just mm -hmm. to look at what are the big things happening with your business? Where are we going to be before the end of the year? That's probably a good indicator. You know, I, I separate the two groups between tax recorders and tax mm -hmm. advisors. So right. you really want an advisor and someone who will look at the numbers with you and help you make decisions as opposed to someone who's like, okay, you did what you did. Let's do the best we can. Yeah, and I think that's a great that's a great piece of advice. So yeah, if if um if your tax person isn't reaching out to you, or if there's a change or something happens, and they're not telling you immediately, here's how mm -hmm. this could impact you positively or negatively, or here's how we could make this work for you. Yeah, then you're probably just paying your once a year CPA, like <laughs> like most prof, you know private people are. Um, what are some other financial strategies that small businesses can can look at to utilize? You know, one of my favorites is something we call the money maximization model. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a strategy that gets rid of what I call the business owner's dilemma. Because the thing that business owners are often dealing with is they're like, okay, do we save our money and have it available for our business? Or do we invest it somewhere and have it work for us? Right. But they're always trying to balance this whole thing. And the, the money maximization model actually helps your money to grow in a place where you can access it. So you're getting returns that are similar to what you might typically get over time in the stock market without all the risk, but also if an emergency comes up like COVID-19 mm -hmm. or if an opportunity comes up, maybe even the shop down the street that does the same thing as you is selling because he doesn't want to deal with all this. He just wants to retire early and you can buy the shop at pennies on the dollar. Then you've got an opportunity and having access to cash, especially for business owners is so incredibly critical, right? And so with this strategy, it creates predictable growth, tax, uh, tax advantages, and also liquidity, which I think is really, really pivotal. So um, I won't get into the details of exactly how that sure. works today, but, but I sure, think but that it, people knowing that there's alternatives is important. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, I think that's a great point because as you say, I mean, when people get consumed in their, in their business, um, they want that kind of cushion of knowing that they have access to cash if you know if they need it so a lot of the times it literally just sits in the bank account right and and then and then the yes. temptation obviously is to siphon that off a little bit here <laughs> and a little bit there right i mean you know yeah. uh, uh, rather than as you say if you have it somewhere that's making you money you can still access it but it maybe it's not you know, so simple to, I mean, it's not so simple that you can get it like without thinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like you said, when it's sitting in the bank account, a lot of people have this thing going in their head, like my money's not working for me. I'm missing out. So it starts burning a hole in their pocket. So they're looking for places to spend it as opposed to having the peace of mind. Hey, my money's growing. We're doing fine. If a really awesome opportunity comes along, we can jump into that, but we're not going to just jump into anything because we're doing fine if it stays there until we need it. Yeah. And, and you touch on something there and let's face it. I mean, this is one of the things that, that kills a lot of small businesses is the whole like cash flow and liquidity. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, as you know, you can, you can start your small business, maybe say it's a consulting business, right? You can consult your business, you can get some clients coming in and everything, everything seems to be great and you're delivering, but you're not getting paid or you're not getting paid <laughs> in a timely manner. Yeah. Right. I mean, you are, I mean, yeah, your chart, you're, you're, you're invoicing. I think this is great, but you're not getting paid in a timely manner. And suddenly the lag between money in your bank account and your expenses going out starts to get untenable. So how yeah. do you, how do you advise people how, how better to manage cash flow and liquidity? Well, I think we need to be aware of what's happening, right? And there's sort of two parts to that equation. There's the money in mm -hmm. and then there's the money out. And I think being aware of the, the factors that do bring the money in and being really honest with yourself about a typical sales cycle or payment cycle, right? If you sell things on terms or you do payment mm -hmm. plans or all these kinds of things over time, I know it's really hard. Like if you're in year one or two, you don't have any metrics, but you got to track that stuff. And how long is it really taking to, from execution to invoicing, to getting paid and then we usually like to see people have one to two year, or one to two months worth of expenses, like full blown, pay all your bills, expenses, mm -hmm. sitting in a savings account, totally liquid, so that you do have a shock absorber and you don't make decisions based on fear. And uh, yeah, and then just tracking it. That doesn't mean you need to be like 
uh, militant about it, but I think you need to check in on a weekly basis and see kind of where are we at, what's happening. Um, are we getting, are we hitting our benchmarks for collections or are we starting to see this lag happen? So we need to address it. Um, I think those are, those are really important things, just awareness in general and having a little bit of a buffer. Yeah, well, I think that's a great piece of advice because there's one thing I, I you know, certainly I've seen throughout my career and that and, and a lot of other people who I talk to is everything takes a little bit longer than you would really <laughs> like it to. And yeah. so you have to be really careful about being too optimistic, as you said, I mean, to think, oh, yeah, well, this is great. And I'll, I'll set I'll set 30 day terms on everything I do. And then you know, I'll get paid well within 30 days. And it turns out then, well, guess what? You're small. So the unfortunate reality is if you're, especially if you're dealing with big companies and you're a small company, guess what? They don't care. They will, they will pay you in 60, 90 days and they know there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to factor those things in. A hundred percent. And, you know, doing your best to try and put teeth into those kinds of things. But the reality, you know, like late fees and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. where they're incentivized to pay. But at the end of the day, you're, you're absolutely right. You need to be aware of, of where you fit in the equation, how important you are to them. And, uh, you know, how valuable your service is if you're just peripheral and they can just say, ah, we'll string them along. Even if you mm -hmm. threaten to stop serving them, if they're going to be yeah. fine, you might go way down the list of people to get paid. Yeah. So it's good to, it, it's good to have a realistic, uh, a realistic outlook on that to say, yeah, well, I mean, you're going to get paid, but it may be not as fast as you'd like. So to your point, having that buffer there is really critical because I think that's, that's where a lot of businesses get into trouble is when they don't have that buffer and they're just a little bit too over optimistic on cash flow. Yeah. And I, and I think the biggest thing that people can take, like when I talk to business owners or talk to people personally, uh, is you need to have savings and most people want to jump right into investing and they want to focus on growth. But the truth is like the gateway to investing and having the money to grow is you got to have savings. So having a systematic savings plan where a certain percentage of what you make gets set aside mm -hmm. into these accounts that are your buffer. And then we teach people to save into a better account once they've got their savings, you know, they're one or two months there and three to six months personally set aside. Um, but if you, if you have that and you have that habit of saving, you're always getting richer every single month, every single month. And maybe opportunities come along, but those opportunities are going to be things that create more revenue for you, not necessarily something else. Or if an emergency comes along, you can stay afloat and stay, you know, continue to make good decisions long term for your business. You don't have to like fire sale things. So I think just systematic savings. Uh, building those buffers is just such a huge piece that a lot of people try and skip over because they're getting to growth and they're trying to mm -hmm. redline it all the time. And the truth is every year is not going to be your best year. We're going to probably see a lot of businesses get pulled back this year, even the ones oh, yeah. that stay in business. You got to be prepared for that. So are you, I mean, given the situation that we're in right now, are have you, have you altered the, the advice that you're giving maybe, on on investment or where to put your money for growth right now have you has that altered at all during this time uh not where we teach people to save the money and and grow it within the money maximization model because we don't mm -hmm. we don't like things that are market-based because the market mm -hmm. you know if you know anything about monetary cycles the markets go up and the markets pull back and you know especially right now we live in kind of a speculative society everybody's trying sure. to play the greater fool game so we don't think that that's something that as a, as a business owner, you should be involved in unless that is your business, right? If you're a full-time real estate investor, you're a full-time mm -hmm. stock trader, that's totally different than a guy who runs an auto shop trying to compete with the, the guys who went to Harvard in the stock market. Like he's not yeah. going to win that game, right? So we think tried and true, steady, Eddie, things that go up all the time. Are, are where you store your cash. And then you just focus on being really great at your business because that's truly where you're going to make your big money. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say it, 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 is an interesting, it is an interesting point. And I think that unfortunately, you know, people tend to jump around a lot and uh, chase shiny new toys and, you know, be, be constantly, um, you know, moving things around and thinking, well, I, you know, I, oh, look, I could get a much better return over here. But then you're mm -hmm. actually, but then they end up, distracting themselves from their core business because then they end up, as you said, playing the amateur stock trader. I, I totally had a dentist and this guy made $500,000 a year and he used to go into his office anytime he had free time and like stock trade and he'd make an extra 15 or $20,000 a year. And I'm like, 
how much time do you spend in there? He's like, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 hours a week. And I'm like, if you were training your team, you'd probably make an extra 200 grand, right? Yeah, like exactly. focus on your, your core business. So if, if that's your main business, that's fine. But if it's not for most people, it's a distraction. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so what are, what are some other things that you see that small other uh, mistakes that small businesses or owners make that maybe is easily more easily avoidable? Well, the, the biggest one uh, is just tracking. A lot of business mm -hmm. owners, they want to make the money, but they don't want to pay attention to where it's all going, right? And so the, the most common thing I hear is we make a lot of money and it all comes in, but we don't know where it's all going, right? Like we made Two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year for the last couple of years, and we have hardly anything to show for it. And they're just—they're not tracking. They have no idea where they're spending their money and what their real costs are. I'll ask people all the time, "How much does it cost for a month to run your business?" And they're like, uh, "I don't know, forty, mm -hmm. fifty, sixty thousand dollars." You know, if you don't even know within a fifty percent margin, you should probably start paying attention to that. Because uh, I found in my own experience, listen, I was flipping real estate back in, in 2008 and nine, And I went through when my business started to crash because I was in Southern California sure. and all the houses crashed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was spending $3,000 a month on services I didn't even use anymore. And I didn't even know because I was making three or $400,000 mm -hmm. a year. So there's just tons of that stuff that's continually like atrophying your cash flow if you don't pay attention to it. Um, and it can be a lot worse than that. So I think general awareness and just ideally, if you don't like your books, get a bookkeeper and just go mm -hmm. over them once a week, just 15 minutes. That's all you got to do. And to be honest, I mean, it's, uh, it's so much easier nowadays to track everything because most things is digital. You know, you can, you can figure it out. However, to your point though, that's a double-edged sword because it's very easy also to sign up for services and forget that you signed up for them, right? And, uh, and you're not even yeah. using them. So yeah, I think I think that's a that's a critical piece. And as I said, it's not that hard to do if you put your mind to it. But I, I honestly, I do think if you're not tracking, if you're not tracking your outgoings, and and to be honest, I mean, if you're a small business or a single proprietor, or whatever, if you are not relentless almost in in tracking your expenditure, you know, that that's not a good foundation. Yeah, it just ends up being a much larger portion for for people like that, right? Then like these huge businesses, they mm -hmm. sign up for a thousand dollar a month service. Maybe use a small business, it's a hundred dollars a month, but they're mm -hmm. running 200 million through and you're running 500,000 through or whatever. It's uh, exactly proportionally, it's way out of whack. It is. It's like anytime you do your, you know, you do your own home finances and you think about all these little services you have here, there and everywhere. And they, well, they don't cost that much until you suddenly add them all up and you think, wow, that's a lot of outgoings. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where that $1,500 a month is going. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. In the last few minutes here, uh, Derek, is any other just last piece of advice you would give to a small business or uh, sole proprietor? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is this. Uh, and some people may not like this, but I really think for most people, um, they're investing in things that they don't, they don't understand. And so I think if mm -hmm. you're going to start saving your life savings somewhere, the three rules I have is it should be something you know about, something you care about, and something you control. And you want to know about it because if you don't know anything about it, you probably shouldn't store your life savings there. Yep. If you don't care about it, you're not going to pay attention. And listen, anything you don't pay attention to in your life mm -hmm. doesn't work. You don't pay attention to your significant other. How does that go? You don't pay attention to your health. How does that go? You don't pay attention to your money. Same thing, right? And then things that you control. If you don't control something, like for most people, if the stock market crashes and it, who knows, it might in the near future, most people's options are stay in or sell. Mm -hmm. That's it. You either, like if the market crashed tomorrow, you're like, holy cow, what do I do? You either get out and take a loss or you wait and hope it eventually goes back up. But and long term, it will just because of inflation. But, you know, many people don't realize that from like 1997 to like 2011, if you look at the stock market, it was flat. I mean, it did all of this, but you were yeah. in the same place in 2011 as you were in 97. And people had no control. What, what else are they going to do? So I would say, if you truly want to be a steward with your money, figure out the things that you know about, care about and control. Start looking for opportunities in that direction. And if you do that, you're going to get much greater results. You can keep risk a lot lower. You can get much better rates of return consistently. And the, the control you have in your life 
will just feel so much better. It'll build your confidence. You'll learn new skills. It's to me, it's just such a better way to go. Yeah. So d- don't jump into Bitcoin because you heard it was cool. <laughs> no, I mean <laughs> it may it may have some some uh, some merit, and I there's some yeah. people I highly recommend who are or highly respect that are recommending it. But I don't know yeah. about Bitcoin. I don't want to be mm-hmm. a Bitcoin expert, so I'm not putting my money there. Yeah, and I think that's it. That's just a that's just a really good analogy to you know because um, I think because I think oftentimes. You know, people kind of fool themselves a little bit into thinking, well, I, I kind of understand stocks, so I understand <laughs> this. Maybe, you know, you know, foreign exchange trading doesn't look that hard or whatever. But to your point is like, unless you're really going to learn about it, you're, you're, you're one of those investors that other, there's another investor somewhere who's rubbing his hands going, oh, great, here's another, here's another sucker. <laughs> well, if, if you're sitting at the table and you can't see the sucker, you're it. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Listen, Derek, that was great. Uh, all of Derek's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about Big Life Financial. Okay. Well, like you mentioned, we're a, a wealth and tax strategy company. And essentially what we like to do is you and your interviews help people make more money. We help people mm-hmm. keep more of what they make and also be smarter with it. Right. And so uh, I have a free gift that talks about the strategy. I mentioned the money maximization model. Uh, if they go to Big Life Financial forward slash free gift, and they can download a book that uh, kind of goes through that. It goes through some really great financial strategies. If you've got debt, how to pay that down the best, um, how to build your money, how to keep things safe. So some some really awesome financial stuff there. And the reality is we try to we try to customize everybody's financial needs. We work with business owners and everybody's got a different need and something they're trying to accomplish. So we really want to help you figure out what do you want to accomplish with your life and then build your financial strategy around it rather than the other way around. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Listen, Derek, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Some fantastic advice there for business owners. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.